the first step that you really have to do is you got to pick an idea that really truly matters to you. You know, if you're going to do this type of work and I should pause here, I'm really talking about not just the low hanging fruit, not just sort of the tasks that you knock out, but I'm talking about that type of work that one will bridge that gap between where you currently are and where you want to be. And it's also the work that your soul most clings to doing. Hi, I'm James Taylor, business creativity and innovation keynote speaker. And this is The Creative Life, a show dedicated to you, the creative. If you're looking for motivation, inspiration and advice while at home, at work or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's an author, musician, entrepreneur, performer, designer or thought leader. They'll share with you their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process and much, much more. You'll find show notes for this episode as well as free training on creativity over at jamestaylor.me. Enjoy this episode. Hey there, it's James Taylor, and I'm delighted to have on the show Charlie Gilkey. Charlie Gilkey helps people start finishing the stuff that matters. He is an author, entrepreneur, philosopher, army veteran, and renowned productivity expert. Founder of Productive Flourishing, Charlie helps professional creatives, leaders, and changemakers take meaningful action on work that matters. His new book is called Start Finishing, How to Go from Idea to Done. And it's been getting rave reviews from likes of Daniel Pink and Jonathan Fields, while Seth Godin called it a game changer and a modern day classic. It's my great pleasure to have Charlie with us today. So welcome, Charlie. James, thanks so much for having me today and bearing with my slightly raspy voice from this cold that I've got. <laughs> so share with it, apart from having a cold, what else is going on in your world just now? Um, you know, I'm in a really interesting point because I'm about four months out from the book launch and it feels like it's been forever. Um, and it's really one of those things where there's a new book that's working on me at the same time that there's still so much to do with start finishing as far as companion resources and things like that. So it's a really interesting time for me to be working, um, you know, the, the material that, that I produced in the book, I'm, I'm at that point to where I'm having to call some projects and be patient and think about displacement, all the things that I talk about in the book. So I don't know. I mean, the best thing for me is when I write something or create something that um, then becomes a tool that I myself end up having to use and work with. And so I'm just very much in that space right now. So, so take us back because I believe when you, you first left school, going to college, you were ethics. That was your your thing that you were really interested about and but then you kind of took this interesting path in your your life so tell tell us about how you got to where you are today great yeah i was an ethicist and social philosopher and so um and you know a lot of times we kick around i'm a philosopher and like no i was actually i'm getting a graduate degree i've got a master's in it and i'm all but dissertation when it comes to having a phd in philosophy um but I had also, around the 2006 time frame, I had recently redeployed from Operation Iraqi Freedom. I was an Army logistics officer, and I had these two careers going at the same time. I had this graduate career in philosophy going, and then I had this um, Army career going. And it seems so sophomoric now, but at the time, I was like, man, I got to get my stuff together. I'm just not getting it done. Um, what I would say now is like, bro, you got two careers going, like maybe take it easy on yourself. But, you know, I did what any good scholar and um, any good officer would do. I'm like, you know, I'm not the only person that's had this problem to where um, I've got more things to do than I seem to have time. And so I started to do a lot of research on it. And I found, you know, as I read through the productivity literature, I was like, this is great. It's super granular though. And it's really focused on task level action and maybe weekly level action. And then when I read the personal development literature, I was like, well, it's great, but it's too grand. Like it's, you know, stuck at the vision. My, my problem is in this world of projects. I've got all these projects I need to get done. And I, you know, was very fortunate that I'd learned through both Boy Scout and the Army how to get major projects done. Like they really do school you on planning and execution and things like that. And so I found myself having to do a lot of translation and integration and synthesis of what I'd known from philosophy and what I'd known from the Army. And I was like, well, I'm also not the only person with this problem. So to make my too many careers problem worse, I actually started Productive Flourishing or <laughs> what became Productive Flourishing. Um, they had two terrible names before that, but we ended up with Productive Flourishing. And it's been growing since then. And, you know, nowhere on my path when I was 26 or 27 did I think 
you know, I'm going to be a, you know, productivity consultant and I'm going to be a, a, you know, an executive coach and I'm going to be an entrepreneur. That just wasn't what I thought I was going to do. And yet here I am kind of fell into it backwards. So this kind of going back when you involved more thinking about ethics as a top, I mean, actually that's in, in the army, it's got quite a long history of, of the army teaching things like ethics I know at West Point and they teach ethics. And I think there's a philosopher in residence. Uh, I think similar things in the, the UK um, military schools as well. So, um, and they teach obviously a form of project management, they teach project management as well. So is, is there any link between those what might sound as very disparate ideas is idea of ethics and productivity, or do you, do you hold them in different places in your mind? I don't actually, um, because well, there, there's a very tight link. Look, we only have this one life to live, at least that we know of. Um, I'm you know, not going to get into a metaphysical conversation on that, but um, how we choose to spend our time is how we choose to live this life. And there are so many things that we could do that would make this world better for ourselves, for our families, for our communities, for this world. And so I think all too often we divorce um, those two things of like, how are we being the type of people we want to be? How are we becoming this best version of ourselves? And how does the best version of ourselves make the world better? And how does this tie into what's actually on my schedule? Because I think too many people, whether we want to talk about entrepreneurs or executives, um, you know, we, I think, over focus on the career aspects of our lives and the work aspects of our lives and under focus on the work of our lives, the personal work of our lives. And I think a lot of times that's where we're, we're losing that sense of satisfaction, that sense of fulfillment, that sense of purpose, because, you know, we're sort of being torn in two directions. And so I, I don't think we can really separate them. And I know, um, I, you know, I love the show, The Good Place. And one of the recurring lines from The Good Place is everyone hates moral philosophers. And there's, there's a grain of truth to that because um, ethicists and moral philosophers always want to remind us about the impact of our actions and the impact of the choices that we make. And sometimes that could be really overwhelming to have those pushed in front of you. And at the same time, again, um, we have these choices in front of us of how we spend our time. And, you know, not choosing is also a choice. So that's, that's a bit of sort of the existential side of things. But yeah, absolutely. I think they're um, very much interwoven. And so the subtitle of the book was how to go from idea to done. So I guess we almost you can have talked about it there. Some of those self help books are very much in the idea write down your top 50 goals and it's and it's that and it's kind of lofty and it's um it's aspirational in that sense and then you have at the other end of the scale you have um, great books like getting things done david allen which are very more kind of granular i guess so you were looking for this the the, uh, the messy middle <laughs> of of uh, around uh project and so first of all describe how you think about this difference between ideas and projects because we hear this like project, project magic gets moved about a lot, but it can be a little bit hazy as, as a concept sometimes. And it certainly is not the, doesn't sound like the sexiest of idea projects. Yeah, that's the funny thing. I mean, I, this is a sidebar, but it may be relevant, James. Um, sometimes people talk to me about start finishing. They're like, oh, this is a great project management book. And I'm like, ooh, it is, but it's more than that because I don't know that so many of, of us creative folks wake up in the morning and think we have a project management problem. <laughs> like we think we have other problems. Um, but it also turns out we have project management problems too. Um, so one of the things that we do as creative people is any like good idea that comes across to us, we immediately, I think, apply some commitment juice to it. Like I should do that. Or, Ooh, that's a good idea. And it's not just, that's a good idea. It's that's a good idea. Therefore I like, it has some weight on me. And that's the thing, like ideas are inert. Um, they could be good, they could be great, but they don't actually have that sense of needing to be done. And not every good idea you come across is one that's your idea, one that's um, gonna be brought into this world. The difference between an idea and a project is a project requires you to start thinking about goals, start thinking about you know how you're gonna get it done, how it's gonna get on your schedule, how that project is going to fit into the rest of the project, the rest of the project deck that you have and how you're going to 
pull that idea through the friction of this world to make it happen. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of like if you imagine a Venn diagram where, you know, all projects start with an idea, um, but not all ideas become projects. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that I wanted to do with this book, especially for creative book, for creative people, is to give us the permission to let good ideas just remain good ideas and not become something that starts putting that pressure and weight on us and not do the thing that we all too often do is we get that good idea that it ends up being a bright, shiny object. And we end up chasing it for two hours or two weeks, two months, two years, whatever. And then realize that the whole time we should have been working on this other thing that was actually really valuable that was going to move the needle forward for us. And the reason I've, I like focusing so much on projects is because projects are both mirrors and bridges. They're mirrors because they reflect what's going on in our internal world and our external world. And all of us have like had that idea. We tried to make it a project. And as soon as you start doing that, you know, maybe some of that internal stuff starts coming up and what I call head trash and the stories you have about yourself start coming up and making you think you can't do it. You know, who am I? Is this the right time? So on and so forth. But it's also a mirror to what's happening in your external world. Like it really makes clear how you're making choices, what's on your schedule, what you can and can't do. Now that's the first part of it, the mirrors, but they're also bridges. Finished projects bridge the gap between your current world and the world you want to live in, between your current life and the best life, between your current work and your best work. And so when you really understand that if you want to make these types of changes in your life, you're going to have to finish certain types of projects to get them there. And so that's the thing that I think we all too, all too often forget is like finishing projects is what it takes or it's what it takes to build that bridge from where we are to where we most want to be. So you mentioned there on, on the mirror side, this idea of head trash, I guess someone like Stephen Pressfield would call it resistance that when you have to start um, really reflect and think, okay, I'm a, how am I going to do this? And it kind of starts to feel a bit, it moves from being a romantic idea to something with perhaps a date on it and so, some kind of structure that you have to have to have to place in it is it, in the book was there anything as you were kind of reflecting and writing the book to deal with that because i know that that's an area that that a lot of creatives really struggle with is is as they start to put that plan out kind of falling maybe falling out of love uh, with with an idea but is that is that okay to to do that is that or or how do you know to kind of uh push keep pushing through with something keep pushing through with a project what kind of keeps you on track as you're going through that process and, and kind of putting out all those stakes and figuring out how you're going to achieve something yeah i think um some of the ideas that we have are um really cool in our heads they're really cerebral like wouldn't it be nice if wouldn't it be cool if you know and we sort of stay in that space but i think the ideas that truly matter in the end and the ones that become projects that we will finish are the ones that tug on our hearts and souls um, because finishing them matters to like not just in that sense of wouldn't it be cool but is in the sense of this will make a difference in the world to me or to other people or um, this will solve a problem or deliver a delight and I think that's what you have to focus on at a certain point and all too often especially those bright shiny objects they're like those cool ideas wouldn't it be cool if right that frankly, are never going to win the cage match of different priorities and projects that you've already got going. And I know cage match is an American wrestling reference. And so it's just basically the idea that at any given point, we are already like loaded down with priorities, with responsibilities, obligations, and projects that we've already committed to. Anything new that comes in has to beat something that we're already doing. And we don't think about that too often because I think we get latched onto the idea in, in isolation without thinking about how does this fit into the broader context of mm. meaning making that I'm doing. And so any new idea that comes in um, has to be weightier and more compelling than what you're currently doing. And or you have to do some analysis about some of the things that you're currently doing and figuring out like, why am I doing those? Do they really matter? Is this thing that I'm doing something that I would want to be on my Vita? Is it something that I would want to celebrate at the end of the year? 
Um, and you know, there's some other exercises where you can use to sort of call some of the problems or some of the projects that you currently have. But my starting point, James, is that many of us are already full of ideas and works and responsibilities and things like that, right? And so anything new that comes in has to beat that. Yeah. And so, so you think you ahead. think it's basically you're thinking then as you're thinking through these ideas and deciding, okay, whether this is worth actually making that list of product, you're you're also having to take into consideration opportunity costs resources available and as you said how did this align with my you know something like simon Sinek we call it my big why or you know what, what the change that you want to make in the world absolutely and if you know i think all too often we make planning a cerebral exercise when it's really an emotional exercise because i think if you haven't done that sort of decision, if you haven't done that triage, if you haven't gotten to the point to where you've had to let something go and you feel that sting of regret and grief and frustration, then you really haven't done the work. Um, because inevitably, you're going to have to let some things go that would otherwise be fun to do or maybe cool to do to do the things that matter most. And all too often, instead of like doing the, the hard emotional work of saying, here are the things that I'm going to do, and here are the things that I've decided I'm not going to do. We instead just sort of put it into some sort of safe space of like, well, maybe someday later I'll get to it. I don't want to decide on it now. Yeah. So I'll put it in that closet of the soul where I stuff everything. <laughs> and then at some point I'll be able to think about it. But the thing is we keep stuffing that closet so full of just ideas and things like that, that we don't even want to look at it. And at a certain point we start giving up. So yes, absolutely. It's, I I, I do Go like ahead. your, your I, I think that phrase, that possibly a phrase of the day will be idea triage. I quite like the idea about doing the, <laughs> but very quickly being able to make that some of those assessments of which ones we, we can have to think about, which ones we have to move into that, that cupboard uh, sometimes for, for, for a later time. In, in the book, you talk about this, um, as you talk about obviously the, the, the emotional piece of this about why why it matters, uh, the kind of the taking meaningful action on work that matters. Then you start kind of going into the, the more tactical, I guess, uh, you, you, and you lay out a, a nine step method for converting an idea into a project. And obviously in the book, it kind of goes into lots of detail on that, but can you just give us like the, the, kind of the top line of that, about that, those steps that, in, that an idea has to go through into becoming that project? Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, one of the things we have to look at here is um, one of the first steps is that it has to, it has to fit into that broader space, that broader context of the work that you're going to do. So um, the first step that you really have to do is you got to pick an idea that really truly matters to you. Um, you know, if you're going to do this type of work and I should pause here, I'm really talking about not just the low hanging fruit, not just sort of the tasks that you knock out, but I'm talking about that type of work that one will bridge that gap between where you currently are and where you want to be. Um, and it's also the work that your soul most clings to doing. And so it's this type of work, I think, that a lot of times ends up getting put in that someday maybe space. Um, and so, you know, the first one gets to be kind of easy, like pick an idea that matters to you. And again, if there's not some pain, if there's not some wincing, or if there's not some sort of deep calling to it, it's unlikely that when it comes time to work through the difficulty of the project, that you're going to see it through. It's going to end up, you know, sort of in one of those tar pits that you never get out of. And um, the second one is to convert your idea into a project. And that's just working through making it into a goal. It, it goes into um, building a group of people around you that I call a success pack that help you go through it. Um, the next step would be to make space for your project, which means like, as I said earlier, if you're already full, and you try to take on a new project, that's not going to work. How are you going to do it? So you got to go through. And sometimes this means that you need to put that project that you just decided you're going to do on pause so that you can do like a project um, snowball and clear up some time. And that's kind of taking the idea of the debt snowball that you've heard about, maybe from Dave Ramsey, mm -hmm. where you pay off one bill and then you take the money that you've been paying on that bill and you put it on another one. You could do the same thing with time and projects. Next step is you build a project roadmap. How are you going to get it done? How is this going to get done over time? Next step would be um, really going through and accounting for what I call drag points. And drag points are just those natural places where your project is going to find some friction in the world and, you know, working through how you're going to overcome that and not pretending as if 
you won't fight the drag of, you know, reality pushing against your project. Um, the next would be then getting that project broken down into smaller parts that you can get on your schedule. Um, next part is building the daily momentum, which is largely figuring out how you're going to work through the natural setbacks and challenges that will come up as you're working through a project. And then lastly, finishing strong, um, which means a lot of, a lot of us don't think about what needs to happen after we finish a project. And we sort of, um, I'll use an American baseball reference here. We sort of, you know, walk into home base and get back and, you know, start swinging right away without thinking about the fact that, wait a second, like there are some steps that need to happen to really finish a project strong that will propel you into the next project even, um, even more powerfully and even more capable um, to get that next project done. So it's very much going through that. And, you know, the thing that I wanted to be clear and it's sort of built into the structure of the book is there's a bit of a hero's journey thing going on here, right? That as soon as you take a few steps with some of these best work projects, there'll be a new challenge, there'll be a new obstacle. And it's this ever increasing, um, you know, complexity and difficulty that can come with that. And what I want people to realize is that like, it's not just them. I've worked with so many people, James, that like end up with the story that like when they start struggling with the project that something's wrong with them because other people have this figured out, right? Seth Godin has it figured out. James Clear has it figured out. But the reality is we all walk through these challenges and we all walk, work through them. And so it's not that, you know, having challenges on the project means that everything is okay. Um, and in fact, it's one of those things where I think if you're doing work and you're not coming against some of these very sometimes personal challenges, you're really not doing the work, the best work that you could do. Hmm. So one, you mentioned that the hero's journey there, um, allies and, and enemies that we pick up along that, that path. Uh, I, I guess your, your coworkers can sometimes fit into both, both of those. Um, as you're kind of working on this project, there, there is obviously we have things like Slack now, we have email, people are calling all the time. How do you, um, how do you kind of deal with many of the, the interruptions that are coming out throughout the course of the day from people that often that you're working with? So sometimes you have to, they may have more seniority to you, so you feel like you have to drop everything else in order to kind of satisfy what their goal. But how do you ensure that your project can continue on while at the same time dealing with some of these distract these interruptions? You know, that's a great question. I think we need to address it for sort of two camps of people. Um, because I think for the entrepreneurs and the, and the people who have a lot of autonomy over their own time, it's a different challenge than the people who actually do have coworkers and bosses um, that have a very strong um, say about how you use your time. I'll just put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think I'll start with the latter. Um, it's really about alignment. And one of the challenges that are, that are brought up in chapter two of the book is poor team alignment. And it's a core human challenge that keeps us from doing our best work. And so from a work perspective, if you can align your projects with your boss's priorities and explain how working a certain way is going to achieve her priorities, um, it turns out that she's probably going to be pretty receptive to your plan as long as you deliver against it. Right. And so I think thinking about, okay, I've got this project that really does matter for my work, meaning it matters for my boss's priorities, gives you a lot of leeway to negotiate how you're going to firewall the time that you need to do it. And so it may be going to your boss and saying, look, boss, like for this particular priority that you have, here's a project that I'm working on. Um, I need to make a, you know, I think I can make the best progress on it if I took Tuesday mornings and just worked in the, that unused conference room that we have and just got it done. I'm not going to be on email. I'm not going to be on Slack. I'm not going to be interruptible, but I'm going to be able to show massive progress and I can report in on that progress about how we're doing. Um, she's more likely going to say, okay, cool. Like that, go do that. And once you have her blessing, it's easier to talk to your coworkers because yeah. basically the boss said it was okay. But what if, what if sometimes if your boss has actually quite poor project management <laughs> skills and you, you, you know, you have your set, you're, you're, you're taking your ideas, your project, you're thinking about, you're creating that roadmap, you're thinking about the potential drag points, but maybe that person that's more senior to you 
doesn't have some of those skills or hasn't thought about them projects in that way? Should you just go and get quietly slip them a copy of the, of the book or is there anything you could do to kind of train up? Yeah, well, I was going to say slide them a copy of the book. <laughs> um, but um, aside from that, um, I think, look, sometimes I get um, objections around how this might work in a organization or corporate environment. And I just want to remind people that I actually used some of these when I was in the army. And so if I can look at a colonel when I'm a lieutenant and say, look, sir, you've given me these 17 priorities. Here's currently what I've got. I can't do them all. Which do you, which are the highest priority for you? If I could do that in the army, you could probably do that in your workspace, in your yeah. workspace. And so I think part of it is, um, you know, well, here's what I'll say. One of the, I wanted to do a lot of things with the book and that's, that's what books are great for you because you get to do a lot of things, but I wanted to give us a lingua franca as it were, for how to talk about projects and some of the challenges that we're having. And so using some of the language from the book can be helpful because if you're going to your boss and you're saying, look, we've got competing priorities here. Um, we want to do X versus, you know, we said that we want to do X, but we've completely allocated all of our resources to do Y and, you know, we're not making progress on X and you can have that conversation about competing priorities mm -hmm. and get that alignment. And, you know, that's the unfortunate thing is that in, the work environment we're talking about, your boss may kill your project. It might be your beloved project. It might be the thing you most want to do. And it just doesn't line up with her priorities. Um, you know, many people, they, they live their, they look kind of living more in their daily schedule. So they maybe on a, on a Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening or a Friday afternoon or Monday morning, then they kind of go back up to that level again, thinking about the, the projects. But most of us are kind of living in that the kind of day. What do I have to achieve today? In the book, you talk about this five projects rule on how to kind of prioritize that daily schedule and how to think about when you have all these competing projects and these different priorities about how you can have set out to so you can stay sane <laughs> at the same yeah. time yeah um so before i slide into that what i want to say is if you're just getting through the day and you're just sort of managing the day um i hate to say it this way but you're losing the battle of your career because um you're just treading water at a certain point and just getting through that sort of stuff is not going to set you up well for promotions for excelling and things like that so you got to sort of look higher than that and um to your point about the five projects rule it's it's a longer way of saying it and so i'll say it the long way because it's the easiest way to explain it so it's really no more than five active projects per time perspective and to get the most grip on it i'm going to start with the end per time perspective most of us intuitively know the difference between a week-sized project and a month-sized project. Just like we understand the intuitive difference between a month-sized project and a quarter-sized project and a quarter-sized project and a year-sized project. Now, where we get in trouble is that when we're thinking about everything we need to do, we smush those time perspectives together too quickly and it can create some overwhelm. And so really what we want to do is if you have sort of a, let's, let's, I'll talk about the quarterly level because that's where many of us start to get a little bit fuzzy. But if you know at work that you have this quarter size project that you're trying to get through, you also know that there are probably at least month size pieces of that that you can use to chunk it down into smaller pieces. And that month size piece can be chunked down into week size pieces. And so that when you roll into a week, you can think, okay, this week, we fix that time perspective what are the five projects that I'm going to finish? What are the five week size projects that I'm going to do this week? And how do those relate to the ones that are at my month size projects? Um, and so on and so forth. So you're not all starting the week from a blank slate. And you're also not just trying to get through your email and not just trying to get through the meetings. You're looking at how your time is constructively going towards those, um, for lack of better words, I'll just say strategic projects that are going to drive you forward. And it's a really, James, it's a really, really hard exercise for a lot of people to say five projects that they think about everything that needs to get done. And you don't necessarily need to count all the background recurring projects. You don't need to count all of that sort of stuff in the background unless there's so much background stuff that you can't actually put anything new on the deck, which is a reality for many of us. Um, but that five projects rule just helps you when you're thinking about that particular point in time that week, what five projects, when you're thinking about that month, 
okay, what are the five month size projects that I'm focusing on now to push things forward? The last thing that we haven't really talked about on this, James, is a project is anything that takes time, energy, and attention. And too many of us are not looking at the projects of our life and thinking about them as such. So for instance, getting married is a project, getting the kids, you know, back to school when they've been out of school or, you know, transitioning them being underfoot when they've been in school, that can count as a project. Divorces, recovering from car accidents, all sorts of things like that, that are actually the stuff of our lives count as projects. And so they count in this five projects rule sort of scenario as well. And as a general Mm -hmm. guideline, I encourage people to think three economic sort of work projects and two personal projects and see how you can balance with that. And and also for some people on those doing that where let's say three and two, for example, um, some people that works very well, but I can also imagine it in terms of other people's lives, uh, maybe their, their, their life or their work maybe means that they have to do for these two months. It kind of almost has to be, uh, five economic, five economic, and then they take two months off, two months, which is to focus on like five personal, five, five personal. So you can, so you can, I guess you can, you can have to know yourself in this as well. Kind of going back to the philosophy, kind of knowing how you work and what your, your flow is and how you think about your life and how you have to structure your life. Absolutely. And I'm not going to be prescriptive and tell people that like the, the, you know, the two months, of economic projects and the one month off won't work because that does work for some people. I've met them. Right. Um, what I will say is too many of us punt, um, the, we punt the work of our lives into some future date. Like, Oh, well I'll work super hard now on my economic work and I'll do that for three months and then I'll take a vacation or I'll take a break and that break doesn't happen. Yeah. And so just be honest with yourself about that and, um, understand that, um, you know, a lot of people, some of the pushback that I'll get about the five projects rule, James, and I'm, I'm, I'm like, why am I telling you about all the pushback? But anyways, I'm going to do it anyways. <laughs> um, is that people are like, there's no way, there's no way, Charlie, that I could focus on three economic projects per week and get those done and that be enough. But really, when I look at so many people's, you know, to-do list and what we're doing, like getting three really significant projects done a week is a big deal for a lot of us. Most of us don't do that, right? We sort of half get one done and then we're involved in a bunch of other stuff and we beat ourselves up at the end of the week. And so the reality is getting, you know, two or three, and remember the rule is no more than, you may not be able to do that, right? You may only be able to focus on one significant project a week that puts points on the board for for your business or your team. And over the weeks, man, if you do this time and time again, you end up being that person that's getting it done, that's pulling the team forward because so many of us are trapped into the whirlwind and the busyness of business. Yeah. And, and I think kind of going back to the, you know, where, where we kind of started just talking about doing work that matters as well. I, I guess that making those, that, you know, three projects, um, you know, that, that requires a certain type of, discipline and knowing what matters and knowing knowing your your kind of values i guess as well um to to be able to be to have that kind of level of discipline to say yes i could do all these things but actually these are the ones that are going to have the biggest reverberation in my life and the lives of the people i care for absolutely um and what i want to say here is not all of the projects have to be cashed out in economic terms, right? So there at work, there may be projects that you cash out in terms of sales or revenue or whatever that you want to look at on that. But it could be certain types of projects that you do that just advance the most happiness for you and advance the most thriving for you and the people around you. And so it could be that the most important project that you do is work out is develop the the process and, and getting to working out three times a week so that you feel better, you get your health and energy back and, you know, your work off, you know, some of the emotional frustrations of work or whatever that story is. Sometimes it's as simple as establishing that type of routine that can be the project that makes everything else work so much better in your life. And as you were researching this book and then writing this book, um, was there a key aha moment, a point when you went, oh, okay, you know, 
uh, light bulb. You know, I, I didn't think about it in this way. You made an important distinction that now reverberates in the way you live your life. I don't know if I had a, like a conceptual aha as much as I had a um, sort of lived in the bones, like this is what it feels like flow aha. And part of, um, you know, it sounds, it sounds however it's going to sound, James, but one of the things I had to do to get this book done was give myself a uh, coffee shop budget um, to get it done because I've worked from home and I've worked from home for a long time. But when it came time to getting this book done and, and getting the writing done, I wasn't doing my best work from my home office. And I had all sorts of head trash about going down to the coffee shop, you know, and spending eight to, you know, eight to 12 bucks a day, you know, in coffee and food and things like that. And I was like, ah, oh, that's stupid. I should be able to work from home. And so I fought that for like two or three months. And then the book wasn't getting written. And finally, I was like, you know what? That's not working. And I just need to, you know, go through our budget, get a conversation going with my wife and to say, here's what I need to have happen. And just really lean into like what it took to make space and invest in a project and to be okay with doing whatever it took. Yeah. And it was super awkward for like the first month, but two or three months into it. And when I was just in that flow and in that groove and words were flowing, I was meeting deadline, meeting and beating and exceeding deadlines and things like that. I was like, Oh, you know, this is a flow that I haven't been into in a long time, just because I haven't had a book or I haven't had a major project that became the organizing principle of my work in so long. And so it was really one of those things of like the, this sort of existential aha I was like, ah, where so many of us are falling down is that we're not really using our best work projects as an organizing principle for our days and weeks and instead trying to cram them in and, and make do. And so it was, it was a really big um, realization for me. Environments can have such a huge effect on levels of creativity. I think it was someone like uh, Ernest Hemingway who said he always needed to have three cafes in his life. One that he would uh, eat in and drink in, one that he would work in and write, it, uh, write in, and another one that he would socialize. And he said the trick was always never to get those mixed up <laughs> said, because the impact of your life and your, your work would, would, uh, would go down if you tried to mix those places up. And he, he had a different space in his head for those different places where he would do those different things. Um, finally, I just start to finish up here. I'd love to know, do you have any, is there an online tool or an app or an online resource that you find particularly useful in doing your projects and, and, and getting, you know, getting some of those big uh, goals in your life achieved. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, there are quite a few apps, but I'll try to, I'll try to give the short list here. Um, one is cold Turkey blocker, cold Turkey blocker. Um, and what cold Turkey block you blocker will allow you to do is it's um, one of the blocking apps. I think it's both on Mac and PC, but um, it will allow you to block websites and applications. Um, from being able to be used during certain periods. And what I love about Cold Turkey Blocker is that you can schedule it. Um, so you can say, you know what, from eight to 10 o'clock in the morning, um, I can only use these apps or that I can't use, or I can't go to these apps or websites. Mm -hmm. And why that was super powerful for me is, um, you know, um, just like any of, the, any of the rest of us, like I'm prone to distractions, I'm prone to clicking on the wrong thing and there I am in a click hole two hours later. Right. Um, and it just prevented that whole thing. And importantly for me, um, my willpower wanes at, you know, 415, 420 in a day. Um, and so at 430, it shuts off social media. <laughs> um, so you, so you, you, you've, you've trained it to, to know your, your weaknesses, your weak points. Yeah, I've trained it to know my weak points and I know what my weak points are. And so that way I don't end up, you know, jumping on the Twitter at 420 and then, you know, it's 630 at night and I'm, you know, yelling to Angela, like one more thing and I'm just clicking and not actually doing any work. Yeah. Right. And so um, super powerful tool. Um, I think writers should definitely know about 750 words.com. Um, it's kind of like doing morning pages digitally mm -hmm. um, just because it's a great um, It's part of my cold start routine for when I hadn't written in a while is I would, um, and for a while, that mean, if I hadn't written every, you know, if I haven't written in about five days, I could get a little cold and resty. So I would order coffee and then write 750 words, you know, of sort of free form, whatever I was thinking to warm myself up and get back into writing group. Okay. I'm um, super helpful. Um, and 
I would say the third app that I would want people to be looking at would be Ulysses um, because Ulysses is a, it's a more bare born, no, that's not true. Um, it's a writing app that's really great for um, minimalism and you can both structure long form writing, but also get short form writing out. And it's just a really great tool kind of in that Scrivener family mm -hmm. of um, for writers. And so those would be, um, for these types of projects, that the the ones that I would really be recommending to people. Great. And if you could recommend not your own book, but a book by another author that you've had a particular impact or you've you've gifted to other people more often than others, and also one album, one record, what would those be? The book that I've been recommending to the most people is actually um, Eight Dates by the by the Gottmans. Um, and Eight Dates, it's eight structured dates where you go through um, with your partner and ask different things. And I know not everyone has a partner, um, but for people who are in um, relationships, it's been shown time and time again that the quality of that relationship um, is one of the biggest predictors of happiness and success. And so um, I think we should be investing a lot more times into our into the relationship with our spouses and, and, and life partners. And so that's the one that I've gifted to so many different people and that's made such a huge difference for, for a lot of us. Um, so that would be the book. I know you're, you're probably a kind of a person that works out as well. Is there, is there music that gets you kind of pumped up and uh, kind of gets you kind of going when you have to go for those uh, cold morning runs or, or, or when you, you head out there? Yeah, I'm trying to think um, more so than an album. I'm going to do something a little bit more millennial and say um, create a playlist a, a radio either on Pandora or Spotify around collective efforts. It's a conscious hip hop group and not a lot of people know about conscious hip hop. Um, and it's what it sounds like, but it's a really great, um, you know, um, group of artists that, that are saying messages, but saying it in sort of a hip hop style. So that would be what I would recommend for folks. Fantastic. That's a new one. So I'm, we'll put that on the list as well. People get that on the show notes and a final, um, question for you charlie let's imagine you woke up tomorrow morning and you have to start from scratch so you have all the skills all the knowledge that you've acquired over the years but no one knows you and you know no one what would you do how would you restart things i think i would go to the library and it's all about people and here's and i know that seems cliche but the whole trick is finding people who have the problem that you're here to serve and so the reason i said i was going to go to the library would, would be one to ask a librarian but also do some Google searching to see in my local area who have, who has the problems that I can start solving. Um, and, you know, I'm assuming the library would also have the internet. So there would also be people I could reach out to there and start building from scratch again. But again, it's finding a way to be useful to other people is just generally a winning ticket, no matter what happens. And so I would do that all over again. So Start Finishing is out now. Where's the best place for people to go to find out about the book and also find out about uh, more about you and Productive Flourishing? All right, so if you're interested in the book, you can go to startfinishingbook.com. That's all one word. And you can download a free chapter, chapter three, to see if it's for you. Um, and if you're interested in the broader body of work that I do around productivity planning and this intersection of um, personal development and productivity, go to productiveflourishing.com. Fantastic. Well, Charlie, thank you so much for coming on today, sharing all about your creative life. I wish you great success with the book and also your next book, your next big project. So thanks so much today. Thanks for having me, James. If you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.